Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Everybody's doing jolly good. Everybody online, I hope you're doing jolly good. Let's go ahead and pray. I am feeling good this morning. Good morning, Sarah. Don't, don't be trying to hide. Don't be trying to hide. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will uh, uh, we will get started with our lesson this morning. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much um, for your grace. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the certainty of it, Lord, that we don't have to grasp uh, uh, at straws throughout life, Lord, but uh, that you give us certainty, certainty about our position in Christ, certainty about the future, um, certainty about who you are and about who we are, Lord, um, in light of your truth. We thank you, Lord, so much for this time and pray, God, that this would be instructive and encouraging to us, Lord, and that you would overall be glorified as we seek to gaze upon your face in Scripture. We love you so much, Lord, and give you due praise, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have have, uh, went through six chapters of the book of Revelation, and we are now entering into chapter 7. Um, uh, verses probably one to two this morning, um, or three. Um, let's go ahead and jump in and review a little bit about what we talked about in the last chapter. We've been uh, setting the context here. You know, it's fascinating. God doesn't want us, as I mentioned, to be uncertain about the future. Um, he wants us to be certain about it, and he's given us uh, uh, his word on it, Right. So let's go ahead and uh, and look uh, at the overview of the context of where we are, and then we'll kind of go forward from here. So all of the qualities that have happened up to this point um, are subsequent events that underscore a false kingdom. There is a false kingdom that is established by a conqueror and the effects of that conqueror, right? Um, because the world has embraced this this false messiah, this this false conqueror, um, it is in turmoil and in peril. And ironically, uh, this is uh, something that comes straight from Christ as he is breaking these seals, right, in the previous chapters. Um, uh, These events occur and take place. Now, I want us to turn someplace before we uh, get started. Let's go to Matthew 24 right quick. Matthew 24 is the is the uh, one of the eschatological chapters in the book of Matthew. I, I, I'm not stealing. I don't want to steal any of your thunder. Uh, until I know. Yeah, OK. OK. Hey, right. because you still mine's all the time. <laughs> so I'm going to steal from you. Uh, in chapter 24, we uh, find Christ at the Mount of Olives and he's talking to his disciples and his disciples ask him a very important question. Um, I will I will start uh, at verse three. So as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately because he uh, Jesus turns and looks at the temple and basically uh, talks about how it's going to be torn down. Um, And he goes, uh, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And then uh, uh, Jesus begins to give a kind of a warning in verse four. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, see that no one misleads you all. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom in various places. There will be famines and earthquakes, but all these are them are merely the beginning of birth pangs. If we were to take this uh, chapter, this portion of the chapter, and contrast it with what we've been talking about right now, we find these things that are very similar things that go on and take place within these seals. Um, we see uh, the, the the rise of a false 
installation of a world conqueror. That's Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. The extreme hostility and the negation of peace. We see the rise of famine uh, on the land itself and poverty. As a result of this, we see the rise of death and carnage. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, that, that, that there's death everywhere. Uh, we hear the prayers of the saints of the tribulation in Revelation 6. And then we see uh, uh, some kind of uh, heavenly kind of a uh, strange phenomena that happens. This stuff is not naturally, it doesn't naturally occur in the world itself. And we find that in the in chapter 6, verses 12 to 17, we actually see the word orge, wrath, used. It isn't used before this time, okay? Which is kind of funny. And it sets up everything, all of the events that are going to take place within Revelation chapter 7 onward, okay, because of what's taking place here. Let's go ahead and turn to uh, Revelation 7. Verses 1 to 3. I will read from uh, my scripture, the NASB. Goes after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on any sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the, from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, um, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted um, to harm the earth and the sea, uh, saying, do not harm the earth and the sea. Um, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. We will begin uh, with the letters in red. After this, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on any sea or on any tree. Um, we see this particular phrase um, uh, found um, is animas. Uh, this uh, word that is wind comes from the word air, which discusses atmosphere. Um, you know, the atmosphere that's out there. You go up and look up and there it is, right? Um, this word that is animas is used 31 times in the New Testament text, and this word is used one other time in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. The word animas um, is discussing usually a very strong and violent wind or an intense and heavy gust of wind. All right. This is a, a wind that seeks to do damage, right? Um, um, it destroys things. Uh, think of kind of uh, your 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 uh, intense Category Five hurricanes, right? It is used normally as to refer to a strong gust of wind, but it is also used figuratively in Scripture as well. All right? Let's take a look at some of the usages here in Matthew chapter seven. Verses 25 to 26 and 27. This is uh, Jesus uh, in his discourse to the Jewish people. And after he uh, explains uh, some of the, uh, the qualities and the characteristics of the kingdom, he talks about a, a wise man and a foolish man who builds his house either on the sand or on the rock. And the effects of what happens to these houses in various contexts. He goes, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down and the rivers came and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it did not collapse these strong winds, animas, the gusts of wind. 
because of its foundation was laid on the rock, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down and the rivers came and the animas, the winds blew and beat against the house and it collapsed. And its fall was great, right? So this word here, the, the great winds, this heavy gust of wind, again, uh, Jesus comparing one who uh, uh, not only listens to his word uh, in reference to the Jewish people, but does them, will be like those who have a strong foundation. And when the winds came and they blew, uh, their house will not collapse. In, Ro in Luke chapter 8, verse 24, and following, we read uh, of Jesus uh, with his disciples uh, uh, in, the, in the boat. It says in... Start up at the top here, verse 23. And they set sail as they were sailing. He fell asleep and a storm of wind came down on the lake. And they were being swamped and, and were in danger. And they came and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. So we got up and rebuked the wind and the billowing waves of water and they ceased. That word again is anemos. Because of the wind, it gave a heavy torrent of uh, of of uh of, uh, of wind and waves and things like that. And uh, Jesus rebuked the waves. Verse 25, and he said to them, where's your faith? But they were afraid and were astonished, saying to one another, who is who then is this that even commands the winds and the water and they obey him? In Acts chapter 27, verse Seven. Um, Luke detailing the travels of himself and Paul. It says, after we sailed across the open sea among Sicilia and Pamphylia, we put in at Mara and Lycia. And there, and there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board it. And sailing slowly in many days and with difficulty, we came to Snidus. Because the wind did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmone. So uh, because the wind, the anemos would not let them go any further than they were, uh, they sailed off uh, into another location. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. This is concerning... Uh, uh, doctrine. And Paul uses uh, this word to discuss a person who uh, is not uh, solidified in their doctrine and the purpose of true doctrine. It says, uh, I will start at the top for the building up of the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to a measure of the maturity of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be infants tossed about by waves and carried about by every animas or wind of teaching by the trickery of people, by the craftiness with reference to the, the scheming of deceit. So this is not talking about literal wins, right? I wish that were kind of true, right? If you saw someone getting false doctrine, they're like blowing away, oh, right? Um, but this is talking about the, the, the teaching, the doctrines of men who uh, we can easily be duped if we're not careful. In Revelation chapter six, verse 13, Uh, we just read this last week. This is talking about some of the cosmic things that are happening. It says, and I watched and he opened the sixth seal and a great earthquake took place and the sun became black like sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth like a fig tree throws down its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Tons of uh, asteroids, tons of rocks coming down uh, from the heavens 
Again, this is the, the sign uh, to the world that essentially the wrath of God is uh, going to take place here. And all these cosmic kind of events are underscoring this thing. So let's look at some of the uh, surrounding details of Revelation. Uh, John references the transition of sea. He begins with metatalta. We've talked about this already, that this is just uh, uh, Paul or Paul. John likes to use this term to talk about the transition of scenes, right? Now we're going into a new scene from the one previously before, okay? That is, the previous scene were the six seals that Jesus had broke, right? And the effects of those things that took place. We also read that there are four angels, okay, that are standing on each of the four corners of the earth. Remember, John is seeing this. He's observing this happening and writing it down for us um, and for uh, the saints and for those who will be uh, in this particular time. Each of these angels are, are, are holding back. They're, 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 they're holding back the wind. Again, this word here, animas the strong gusts of wind. And we find very similar language, as a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, uh, the four corners of the earth and things like that. Let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Jeremiah chapter 49. Let's turn there. There are some parallels here that we can find in the Old Testament that reference some of these things. Chapter 49, verse 36. I will start at verse 34 for some context here. says that which came that which came is the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah saying thus says the Lord of hosts behold i'm going to break the bow of Elam the finest in their might i will bring Elam upon the four winds and to the four ends of heaven or the four, the four corners of heaven, and I will scatter them to all the winds. And there will not be a nation where the scattered people of Elam will not go. Okay. In the place of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, in Ezekiel 37, chapter 37, verse 9, we see some similar language here concerning the four corners of heaven, the four corners of the earth, so on and so forth. In Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, we find similar language here as well. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord, Lord Yahweh to the land of Israel, the end comes, the end on the four corners of the land. Now the end is on you. And I will send my anger on you and will judge you according to your ways. And I will bring on to you all detestable things. So we see here the, the four corners of the land, again, concerning the, uh, the nation of Israel and how they will be judged accordingly. It, there will not be a place where they could hide. They can uh, 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 hide out. This will cover the entire land. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 9. Oh, you know what? Yes, yes. It says, and he said to me, this is uh, concerning uh, um, Ezekiel's uh, prophecy of the dry bones and the vision there. It says, and I looked and indeed sinews were upon them and flesh went up and skin covered over them and upward, but breath was not in them. And he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, you must say to the breath, thus says the Lord Yahweh, from the four winds, come, O spirit, and, bre and breath on these dead ones so that they may live. Okay? 
Again, acknowledging uh, the ubiquitous nature of God on these bones here. Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 to 3, or chapter, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Again, we find similar language. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of, as of his head as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and the summary of the words as follows. Daniel explained and said, I was looking in my vision in the night. And look, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The four great beasts were coming out from the sea, differing to one another. So we have this language here of the four winds, the four corners of the land. What does this mean? This just means that it covers everything. It is, it is Jewish language for that reason, that there's nowhere, there's no place where this place isn't going to touch. If these angels are brought, blocking the, the wind from the four corners of the earth, if they remove themselves, then it will affect everything, everywhere. Okay? This result of the actions by the angels will result in the preservation of the land, the sea, and the trees. They're holding back these winds so that these things will be preserved. When it comes to God, just tying some of the general scene together in Revelation 7 from these first verses here, it would appear that the particular word wind, animas, is used as a destructive word, a destructive term. It is used as wrath and fury language concerning the events that are going to transpire. We know this because of what it says in verse 3. We find the angel saying to them, do not to the four angels who are holding back these winds at the four corners, do not harm the earth or the seas or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of God on their foreheads. They're holding back and reserving this for such a time until they can uh, uh, mark these individuals. Pretty easy. It says, and I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. Well, the phrase from the rising of the sun appears seven times over all in scripture. The particular phrase here from the rising of the sun. Um, it is a phrase that is used literally to discuss the rising sun. As you know, we see the sunrise, it's used in that way. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 1, we see this, as a matter of fact, and Psalm 113, verse 3. We will go to Psalm 1. It says, The Lord has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting, right? From Zion, the perfection of beauty. Again, God shines forth. Right. Uh, the Psalter um, acknowledges uh, the natural process of the sun rising. Right. And how God has summoned that and has made it to be, has ordered this to happen. In Psalm 113, verse three. We have a, a similar thing. It says, praise Yah, praise, O servants of Yahweh, praise the name of Yahweh. Let the name of the Lord be blessed from now until forever, from the rising of the sun to its setting all day. Let the name of the Lord be blessed. The intentionality of acknowledging him daily from the rising of the sun, from, from, from the morning to the noonday, all the way into twilight Right. Let the name of Yahweh uh, be favored, be blessed. Acknowledge him. This phrase, too, is not only used to speak of the literal rising of the sun, 
but it's also used to speak of eschatological things as well. Okay? For instance, in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 17 to 18, we find this, this phrase from the rising of the sun. It says, he will put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He will put on garments of vengeance for clothing. And he wrapped himself in zeal as in a robe according to his deeds. So he will repay wrath to his enemies. Gee, I wonder who this is. Hmm. We'll get to we'll 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 get to him in uh, Revelation 19. Requital to those who are his enemies. He will repay requital to the coastlands. So they shall fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the sunrise. For he will come like an arrow stream. The wind of Yahweh as it drives on. And the Redeemer will come from Zion to those in Jacob who turn away from righteousness. His glory will come from the sunrise, from the rising of the sun. Right? As in like dark days come and the dawn shines forth, so will it be uh, when this man who puts righteousness on like a breastplate appears to establish the righteousness of the Lord. Uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. It says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nation, and in every place incense is being presented to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Okay. So this phrase could be associated with the Lord period and his and his fame, his majesty, his reputation. This phrase could be associated with the Lord's glory, right? This phrase can be uh, associated when discussed eschatologically about the Lord's reputation, his name, his majesty, his fame, all of this stuff, that the world will recognize who he is. In the context of Revelation, from the rising of the sun, we find this seal that is held by an angel ascending from the rising of the sun. This phrase points to the hope, the promise of God of deliverance. And this angel coming from the rising of the sun carries a seal. This, in this case, this is a messenger of God ascending to do the work of the Lord. This is a promise passage here. This is kind of fun. Let's, uh, let's continue here. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. We've seen this word before, this word seal, sephargus. It is used 16 times in the New Testament. It is translated as seal, right? Either something that you stamp or, 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 uh, or a, something that leaves behind an insignia, like when they put with wax and they put the seal on there. This word is used in various contexts. It's uh, translated seal as something you could seal something with, as something uh, that denotes possession. Or ownership. Let's uh, look at a couple of uh, instances. In Romans chapter 4, verse 11, we find this word used here. Talking about Abraham and his righteousness. What credited to Abraham for righteousness? How then was it credited while he was cir circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. 
And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness by faith, by which he had while, 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 he had while uncircumcised, so that he could be the father of all who believe, although they are not uncircumcised, so that the righteousness could be credited to them. That's why we look to Abraham as the father of faith, not Moses. Because Abraham was the one who believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was set a seal on him. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 to 2. We find the same instance here. Concerning uh, the seal of apostleship with Paul. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I and have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, yet indeed I am to you, for you are my seal of apostleship. There were some who were doubting that uh, that uh, uh, Paul was a uh, he was a fraud. He was a joke. He was a huckster. And Paul is uh, writing to the saints of Corinth saying, no, 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 that's not true. You you guys are the proof. You guys are the proof of my labor, of my love and dedication to you. Don't believe the hype, right? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the same word Sephargus is used. Again, concerning and contrasting Hymenaeus and Philetus, two individuals who were uh, not teaching properly, says he deviated concerning the truth by saying the resurrection has already taken place and they're upsetting the faith of some. However, the solid foundation of God says firm, having this Sephargus, this seal, the Lord knows who are his and everyone who names the name of the Lord must abstain from unrighteousness. This word Sephargus is used most frequently in the book of Revelation. It is used four times in chapter five when it's talking about the, the, the seals. And it's used six times in chapter six when it's talking about the breaking of the seals that God that Jesus is doing before the Father in procession. In Revelation chapter eight, verse one, If you turn here, we see again the usage of this word, the seal, that he opened the seventh seal and there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. In one sense, this familiar language and situation is also familiar in the Old Testament. Again, I, I, I take the belief that uh, when John is looking at all these things, and seeing all this stuff plays out, played out, he's seen, he's he's read these things before. He's like a Jewish boy, right? And so he's he's seen and, and has and has heard these details before. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter nine. This is very fascinating. This is not this type of thing is not new. This situation. In the midst of the destruction, there's always been the mind to preserve a remnant. Now, again, Ezekiel, this is during the time that uh, it, that Judah essentially is being ransacked. This is this is this is not a good time. Ezekiel chapter nine, verses one and following. Let's go ahead and read this. It says, and he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice. Draw near, O executioners of the city. This is, again, God crying out to a loud voice. Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Behold, six men came from the direction um, uh, of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand. Among them was a certain man clothed in linen, 
with a writing case at his loins. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Verse 3. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to a man clothed in linen at whose loins was, was the writing case. The Lord said to him, that is the one who has the writing case, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem. And put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. Verse five. But the others, uh, but to the others, he said in my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity. And do not spare. Verse 6. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women. But do not touch any man on whom is the mark. And you shall start from my sanctuary. So in this particular passage in Ezekiel, there was a person who was supposed to go and mark all of those who were disgusted with what they saw, who were sighing and groaning about all of the things that were happening with amongst the city. They were to put a mark on their foreheads. And ironically, that right after that guy does that, the people with the destroying weapons would come and lay waste to everyone. But they were not to touch those who had a mark on their forehead. This is something very similar here that parallels uh, Revelation 7. It is consistent with the Old Testament that, again, the Lord is protecting those who recognize him from this destruction, which brings us to the end of this particular uh, verse here in chapter seven, verse three. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Do not harm the earth or the seas or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of God on their foreheads. This is very similar to Ezekiel. And, 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 and the more, the further we get into revelation, by the way, the more this will become a reality because these these uh, these uh, wrath uh, judgments will get worse. And we'll find that there'll be a distinction between groups, which is interesting. This lead angel shouts out to the other angels not to harm all of the things that is in the same order as in verse one. Okay. Adikio is the word here. It comes from the work word adikos, which means unjust or unrighteous. That's, that's the adjective, uh, cognate of this. Um, uh, adikio can be translated as to injure, to harm, to do wrong. This is the, the verb form of this word here, that one seeks to do damage. It is used 38 times, this word adikio, in the New Testament, and it is used nine times in the book of Revelation. We won't go through e we won't go through these, but you'll see it in Revelation chapter two, verses eleven. They will not be harmed by the second death. We see that there. We see it in uh, Revelation chapter six, verse six. Revelation chapter seven, verses two and three. Revelation chapter nine, verse four, Revel and ten, and nineteen. Revelation chapter eleven, verse five. In, a, in chapter 22, verse 11, okay? This word is used as an, uh, as a, uh, uh, as an individual with the intent essentially to destroy or the purpose of destruction, okay? 
Again, all of these instances in the book of Revelation as they're used, all of them, from Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, all the way to 22, verse 11, is, is all talks about damage, carnage. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing, okay? You don't want out of camp. Let's sum up some stuff here right quick. Um, the angel was to mark the bond servants again, do loss. Again, we've seen this, we've seen this word used frequently. We saw it used in Revelation verse one, where John calls himself uh, the bond servant. We see that this is uh, this message is delivered to the bond servants, the do loss. We see that in chapter one, right? And so uh, this is uh, no different here, that the angel was to mark these bond servants. The seal, it would seem, would protect these bond servants of the living God from being destroyed by the acts of the angels, by the way, which is instituted by Christ, right? We still have not uh, seen the last seal broken that's not until chapter eight, but there's some things that we have to take care of first, right? There's some things that need to be tied up before those things commence. All in all, these first three verses really set the tone. I would I put for the rest of the chapter, but it's really it's for the rest of the book here, okay? As the angels of the Lord essentially prepare for destruction, uh, but first they must protect his bond servants from being destroyed along with the world. This is this is before the wrath takes place here, um, and before all this happens, um, uh, these in these individuals uh, are going to be protected from this. That opens up. Chapter 7, verse 1, or verses 1 to 3. Okay. Um, again, um, we find that throughout all of these dark periods that we see throughout the book of Revelation, I hope that you're starting to see a little bit that even though there are some dark things that are going on, there are still rays of hope and grace throughout this book, right? Right? That we see that God is being true to his word and to the promises that he has given uh, his saints. Now, we will talk about uh, those saints and those bond servants um, next week, Lord willing. But what a great what a great thing to know that God, again, even within the midst of this, does not put his saints under wrath. That's not that's not the purpose. Right. Okay, I think we, to be continued, we will continue next week uh, answering some questions about the 144,000. Um, who are they and uh, why is that important? Let's go ahead and pray and then we will, uh, we will end this here. Lord, thank you so much for your word and that your word is clear. It's clear. Um, we may have to work a little hard and do some digging to uh, get the intent of what uh, you uh, are communicating. Uh, but Lord, uh, and that, that might be challenging sometimes, but Lord, uh, you, uh, you, don't, you don't write this to confuse us, um, but you want to make it clear so that we may have certainty, certainty of the hope of the future and the promises found therein with the groups that are there that you promise uh, to deliver, to give a, a future. Um, thank you, Lord, so much, God, for uh, your word and how your word uh, gives us this, this, uh, uh, this information for us to take in and, uh, and be certain about. Thank you, Lord, for this time, and I pray, God, that we would continue, Lord, to be uh, informed by your word and be strengthened, and, um, and by that, Lord, that we would know you even more uh, than the day before. We love you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen.